Hi again, welcome back. Um, unfortunately, Zina was supposed to give the talk a sick, but we found a great replacement. So Jan is here from Guga and will talk about the learnings about how to build a successful um, social game. So please welcome him on stage. So, thank you very much. First of all, I always like to start with a question. Who here would say he's a gamer himself? Okay, that's more than I normally get at conferences or audience where I speak, because classically, people think of gamers as people who play Battlefield 3, um, whatever, these kinds of games, first-person shooters, MMO, RPG games. And this is, this is a picture, actually, it's from the Nintendo website. This is um, how they portray their customers. So you have a bunch of 16 to maybe 30 year olds who play games. To us at VUGA, this goes away completely from reality because if you think about it, playing is a core human need. Everyone plays. You play when you're three years old and when you're 80 years old, you're still playing. It's just different games. And so at VUGA, we set out to bring games to the masses. We looked at gaming and thought, this is the reality in most situations. And uh, what we're trying to do is not this. Everyone who games knows this is fake. Look at the way the man is holding the controller. No one plays like that. So this is another marketing copy website. But our big vision is bringing games to everyone. That means social games, casual games, games you can play in 60 seconds while you're waiting in the supermarket or driving on the subway. That's the games we make. And I won't talk about VUGA too much today, don't worry, one more slide. Um, we've built four or five big franchises with about 50 million active users every month. And mostly for, interestingly enough, women. 70% of our players are women and in a really broad age range, 20 to 60, team of 200. So what I really wanted to do today is present six lessons we learned so far at VUGA. Actually, I hope we learned a lot more in the last three years, but I kind of tried to break it down into six ones you can take along and maybe bring into your own projects. One of the main things we learned is getting the basics right. We had this big idea for a dream cruise simulation game. Uh, sorry, for a cruise ship simulation game called Dream Cruise. Someone had come up with the idea and said, middle-aged American women love cruise ships. So let's make a game about cruise ships. And everyone was, yay, this is a big idea. Actually, we had someone who really likes cruise ships. He went out, did the artwork, uh, thought of all the cities, where we can go, etc. We had really only forgetten, forgotten a few things. What's cool about cruise ships is relaxing and not working on a ship. Because working on a ship is actually, I would say, probably one of the worst jobs you can have. And the second thing, what you do on ships is you go out and explore places. And you don't manage the ship. And so one of the, we made a big mistake in this game, kind of not thinking about the core game loop first, but thinking about the features. And adding features won't make a broken core game loop good. If you imagine, that's also the reason why many people play Commodore 64 games. I think all of you has a game where you still say, I remember that game. The graphics sucked, the sound sucked, but it was super fun to play. And uh, this is one of the main things we learned, is make the core game loop first and make that really fun. And then start adding artwork, graphics, features, sound, 3D animations, all that, all that stuff. Second big learning, don't follow the hippo. It sounds weird now, I'm not talking about those kinds of hippos. It's about the highest paid person's opinion. Generally, in gaming companies, especially in the traditional ones, Activision, Blizzard, Ubisoft, EA, and so on, you have this hierarchy of hippos. You have the CEO, who's the biggest hippo, 
then you have the game lead, then you have the product manager, then you have the assistant product manager, and at the end you have the intern, who's of course the least paid. And that leads to situations where the CEO says, the CEO who's maybe an accountant who came from Coca-Cola, saying, we need more green in the game, or um, it's not fun yet. And this highest paid person's opinion is extremely dangerous, and we know that. And there's a few things we do over a game's life cycle to prevent um, the, high, the hippos in influencing the game design too much. Because it could be the intern who has the best ideas and not the product manager. So when we start out with a new game, this is actually a sketch from Brain Buddies, one of our uh, early successes. We start out with sketches, just sketching the game, just thinking about how we can make it fun. And immediately after that, we take the sketches and do internal testing. And actually, I think the most valuable VUGA prototyping tool is Lego. You all know Lego with the bricks and the boards and so on. And what you can see here, we anonymized him slightly. It's not an actual VUGA employee. Is um, One person is the computer, and the other people are the players. And what the computer is doing is moving characters and pieces of paper and just some kind of artifacts on the game board. And the other people are playing. It even goes down to having pop-up messages and so on. Because then we already can see, is it fun? Do other people at Vuga want to play the prototype? Or is it just two guys we have to force who play it for hours and no one really likes to? So the first stage is really, after the sketching, is really the prototyping using Lego. It sounds basic, but try it, it's really powerful. Then we build prototypes, and this doesn't look like this because the programmer has no sense of style or aesthetics. We purposely make the first Flash versions ugly because we don't want people falling in love with graphics, we don't want people falling in love with characters or styles. We want people to just focus on the game and on nothing else. And actually we have more and more product managers in the teams who are learning Unity, Unity 3D, maybe some of you know it, it's like a gaming development framework, which we don't use in our games when they go live, but we really like it for prototyping because then even a product manager who has an idea can on his own start building a playable demo and try and convince people it's fun. So this is also from Brain Buddies, um, what, the, what one of the first prototypes looked like. And as you can imagine here, the green blocks fall towards the bottom and you have to calculate in your head the result quickly and type it in and then you, you win. Um, Brain Buddies was... Um, was actually one of our first biggest hits. I can't remember the numbers now, but it was played by millions of people. And also played by millions of people because in user testing, which is kind of the fourth stage, we completely changed the game again. This is when we get people in from the street. We actually have a database of people where we mark stuff like uh, age, gender, has an iPhone, plays social games, likes cats, whatever. Um, where we pull in beta testers and then we, um, our product managers can request and say, hey, I need a 35-year-old American woman who plays iPhone games to play this game. And then she comes in and plays the game and we watch her, have five people watching her and hoping that she understands what's happening. And for example, in user testing Brain Buddies, in the beginning, we thought we should build uh, something like Dr. Kawajima's uh, brain jogging because people want to train their brain. We found out no one wants to train his brain. Everyone just wants to see if he's smarter than his friends. And so we kicked out all the stuff we had built about progression and levels and monthly reminders and, and all this stuff. It's just deleted. Uh, because we said, we found out all people want to do is find out I'm smarter than 80% of my friends. And uh, we'd reduced the game and made it more popular that way. And that's kind of the final step for us for preventing hipponess is getting in a lot of users 
in a lot of users' feedback uh, into the game development as early as possible, even when there's nothing there to test yet. Then once we go live, everything kind of changes. It also happens at VUGA that the team composition changes quite a bit, because you have people who are better in the creation phase, generating a ton of ideas, uh, being super creative, saying, okay, we need to bring in this twist I saw in this old Amiga game, which is completely different, but I thought it was really cool to bring this in. What we then switch to is metrics. In fact, uh, the VUGA, one of our kind of company slogans is VUGA hearts plus brains. We try and be, we say, the heart of Pixar and the brains of Google. Um, I mean, we're standing beneath giants, but uh, that's kind of the ambition we have. And after the game launches, we start looking at the brains part much more. One example of what we do is, first of all, generally we track everything that's happening in our games. Um, I don't know how technical of a background most people have here, but we're generally tracking about 15,000 events per second about gameplay behavior. Meaning, um, you can imagine the volume of that. We can just kind of see who is doing what, not which person, but which type of player is doing what, how they're progressing. And one example, what we do is a ton of A-B tests. I don't know if you're all familiar with the concept. We see on the bottom, actually, the original bottom row of the screen. You know where you see which friends of yours are playing? Where you can click on them and go and visit their garden and send them gifts and so on. And what we said, I mean, this is a pretty small button, the little blue one on the right there. That's a pretty small button. But still we thought, we're not sure people get it. Invite, question mark. And so what we proceeded to do is to bring in three variations of the same button and test it meaning about 50% of the users still got the bottom variant and 25% each got one of the other ones. And then here's a, a ratio of invites um, being sent. Actually, the number is wrong. I just noticed when I was flicking through the sides. So let's all pretend there's a plus 11 in the middle there. So what we saw is indexed to 100, people were sending 11% more invites simply because we changed one of the buttons on the right. And what we try and do is to do three of these A-B tests every week. We do weekly deploys of all of our games. We do three A-B tests per week, and they generally run for three to four weeks. So what happens is if every week we're improving one number by 10%, or actually three numbers by 10%, you can imagine the impact that has on a game. And this is not sitting there with a gut feeling, the hippo thing again, saying, I like characters. We should have characters on the button. It's saying, OK, let's try characters. Let's try mystery. And let's try the question mark. Send it out. And let's just see what people think is better and not necessarily our, our hippo. So if you compare if you compare the way the games have developed, here's another big feature we tested, missions. I don't know how many of you have a kind of a background in game development, but missions make or break a game. If the missions are boring, if they're too hard, people stop playing because you just, you can never reach them. And if they're too easy, people stop playing as well because it's boring and you're just churning through the whole time. So missions is a really good example where we were testing, uh, crafting different combinations of products you need. How difficult should it be? Um, does it get harder and harder? Does it stay more linear? And um, on the left is Monster World. When we launched it, the garden looked like that. And then on the right, the garden as it is today. It's probably really hard to see from far away. I mean. We made the plot smaller. There's crafting features where you have to combine multiple products. Uh, there's helpers, there's time missions, there's friends you can help. And all these were features which were gradually brought in uh, just through testing. Oops. So number four is engagement. 
People often like to talk about download numbers. My game got 20,000 downloads on the App Store. My game got 50,000 downloads on the App Store. Diamond Dash got, which is our iOS game, got 30 million downloads on the App Store. So you're sitting there and you're winning against everyone. But number of downloads is really irrelevant as a metric. Engagement is the key. It's really quite simple. I mean, you can imagine if you have 100 million downloads and only 1% come back on the next day, that's a much worse result than if 10% come back on the next day or 20% come back on the next day. You're really churning through your users. And if you look at a typical game or even a product life cycle, this is what it looks like. You have a peak in the beginning and then interest falls off. This is especially more the case for your AAA console games. Um, for example, Grand Theft Auto 4 made half of its revenue in the first four days and the other half the rest of its lifetime. So the peak is incredible and then it really drops down. And, but what you can do is if, you, if you're good at engaging your users, you're good at getting them back every day, they like your game, there's a good progression, there's missions, etc. your curve can go up and up because every download comes back and just keeps on adding to your active users and doesn't churn through your game as quickly as, as it does in this example. So key metrics we also focus on are of the people who downloaded the game today, how many will come back tomorrow? One day retention, three day retention, seven day retention, 14 day retention. And we've had games which are really good in the short term have a great three and seven day retention, but a really bad 30 and 60 and 90 day retention, meaning your game is long term boring. And that's something you have to fix. And so looking at, uh, at engagement numbers is a really big thing, really big part of what we do. Bubble Island is a good example for this. You know, I'll just skip through this. Task cute animations. Um, Bubble Island is a good example for this. In the beginning, we only had the adventure mode, meaning, um, meaning you play through a map, and then you keep on going through this map, and that map, and that map. It just got boring after a while, because normally you'd hit a level, which is not too hard for you, or you're just getting level after level. So what we did in Bubble Island is, again, throw all this out, or actually put it really in the background, and introduce the level of the week, meaning every week you start again and you beat your friends via Facebook and you have this competitiveness, who gets faster, who's further, whose score is higher, and that reloads every week. And that's a good example of something which is built to increase long-term engagement and retention and, um, and not so much just maximizing the number of downloads. Big thing number five is focus. It's especially in games, there's so much you can do. There are so many ideas out there. And you hear of these people who are working on augmented reality, super cool. Or they're working on geo games, also extremely cool. But in the end, um, for us, it's more important to choose one topic and do it really well than just going across all areas. And that's why uh, we say, don't ask, is this a good idea? Augmented reality is a good idea. I think it's super cool. Uh, Geo is as well. It's just not, for us, right now, better than other ideas. And um, what, you can, what happens really quickly, especially when companies like ours get to 200 people, you start losing focus. You have this one guy who takes care of Geo, and you have this one guy who takes care of AR, and you have this one guy who takes care of local social networks, is a really good example as well. And then you start losing focus. We often get asked, why aren't we on Naja Klasna, Odno Klasniki, Vikontakte, Tencent, Renren, uh, Hives, Studifizi, Orkut, and they're all really good business cases. Awkward. We could be really big in Brazil. We're losing out on Russia because we're not on Odno Klasniki and Vikontakte. 
Um, the Netherlands, hives, is really big. But still, for us, it's more important to focus on one social network, which is right now Facebook, and not say we have a good version on Facebook and a not so good version on hives, or we have the separate team which does hives or something like that, but to really focus on one topic. And uh, the reason also why we chose Facebook and, and iOS, it's a bit like Frank Sinatra. You know, they said, uh, he said, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. And um, that's another thing we learned is even if you're in Berlin, we're the only social games developer who's not in California. Even if you're in Berlin, even if you're only three people and an intern, it's good to also aim for the big goals. Don't say you want to be the leading game developer on Hives. You want to be the leading game developer on Odno Um Point to the kind of big pies, but then focus on them and be, be kind of maniac in your focus. In the end, probably this is something you've been hearing over and over again, and I mean there's a bunch of charts on it, but we've really realized social mobile is the future for us. This is a chart. Can you still hear me, by the way? Okay. This is a chart you've probably seen 20 times. Here we have consoles, which is, looks like the little piece of purple dirt on the screen. Uh, then we have tablets, PCs, TVs, and at the end, mobile phones. And if you just look at these numbers, Apple, with the iPhone, built the perfect gaming device, for us at least. You have it in your pocket, it's instantly on, it's easy to understand, easy to get to know. And this is why all new VUGA game development we're starting is on mobile. Mobile is, um, on the one hand, of course, smartphones. What people often underestimate is tablets as well. Um, this is something we've really seen when we launched Diamond Dash, is how many people play on their iPads. That's quite simple. You're sitting on the sofa, TV running, play on your iPad. Advertising comes, play on your iPad. Someone's talking to you and it's boring, pull out your iPad or you're in a meeting or something. So iPads is a, is a whole new form factor where we'll also be doing a lot in the future. And for us, it's even something we're thinking about to doing tablet-only games because of the rich screen, retina display, new interaction possibilities. And um, yeah, right now we have one diamond, one iOS game live, as I said, with 30 million downloads. The nice thing is also for a company, in the end, we don't make games as a hobby. We all love playing games, but it's a business. And mobile users spend three times as much money as uh, desktop gamers. It's also really easy to understand why. If you have an iOS device, you have either a credit card or a bank account saved into that device. So buying is two clicks. If you're playing on the computer and you have to pay, probably you have to stand up, go get your credit card from the next room, type it in, type in the numbers. You're a bit unsure about safety and so on. So people kind of on a per player basis spend three times as much money on their mobile phones than on the desktop. They also play twice as much. The average Diamond Dash player plays nine times per day. So he stops, not rounds, but times. So he stops and starts the game nine times per day on average. So if you imagine curves and so on, you can imagine how long the people at the, how often the people at the end play. So that's really powerful for us. And in our case, using this Facebook connection, we have almost two people, uh, two million people coming each month from Facebook into our mobile game through Jan overtook Peter in Diamond Dash, beat him back, Peter plays on his Facebook, overtakes me, I get a notification on my phone, I play, he gets a notification on his iPad and plays there. So using these circles brings over 2 million players per month back into our games, which is of course super powerful. So um, our plan regarding mobile coming up is Android versions of, of our games, Monster World on iPad and iPhone, and a bunch of other titles we're currently not talking about yet. 
but we were looking at the industry about a year ago and said the console gaming companies, they missed the whole social gaming part. And now all the social gaming companies, of which we are the fourth largest, are missing mobile. Because if you think about the big social gaming companies, King.com, even Playfish, Playdom, etc., partially renamed now, they haven't gone into mobile. And so what we said is we need to shift completely, throw everything on mobile, and really go forward in that direction. That's already pretty much it. Maybe summing up my six points uh, is first of all, get the basics right, build a core game loop, which is fun. And while you're building it, don't be influenced by the hippo's opinion. Test. Test it on users, test it on employees, test early, test often. Third thing is, once it's out, use metrics. Measure, watch what people are doing, and use that power of metrics to change your game iteratively. Number four, engagement is key. It's not about numbers of downloads, it's about keeping people in your game. Number five, focus on big markets, on important markets, things you can do really well. And the last is that uh, the future is, of course, uh, for us at least, it's social and it's mobile. That already sums up the slides and, and my presentation today. I have some time for questions. There's also my email address there, janatvuga.com, if you want to insult me via email because you don't agree. I'm really open to that. But I'd also be happy to answer any questions you may have. Hey, um, my name is Eddie. Um, so quick question. So I've already built out an awesome game. I'm, I'm maybe I have a little bit of money and I'm spending it on marketing. How do I generate revenue? How do, how do I go about in making it more successful so I can dump more money into marketing? And I guess the second question is, where do I market? How do I get users onto my site? Because maybe I don't necessarily have an awesome Facebook page or a Twitter page or you know, Twitter page. Thanks. Okay, so the, um, the first question was how to make money from games, and the second question, if I paraphrase correctly, is um, how to market them, and especially how to use social channels. So regarding monetization, uh, we as a company are putting everything on free-to-play games, meaning the game is free to download. That's really important because as soon as a game costs 49 cents or 99 cents or $1.99 or whatever, there's a huge barrier for people. You can get around that by putting out light versions and things like that, but generally, in our opinion, games have to be free and then monetized through in-game purchases. And if you look at broad market trends, probably 60% of revenue in games is already from free to play on mobile. And then the in-game purchases, in-game purchases are most evil, easily achieved through barriers. So people run against a barrier, monetization barrier, which they can't overcome. So let's say you're playing a bubble shooter game and there's this level which is almost impossible to win, except if you have the golden bubble, which costs 10 cents. So that's, of course, the easier way. What we like, that, however, kills um, engagement and long-term retention because people who run against that barrier, who don't want to pay, stop. And that's why what we like to do more is to use um, what we call energy mechanics, which save you time. So let's say I have this feature I want to reach, and it's four levels away. That might mean eight hours of gameplay I have to put in. And then a good rule of thumb is one euro per hour of gameplay. So you can say you'll save someone five hours of gameplay of, let's say, mindless churning, just doing the same over and over again, five hours for five euros. And of course we don't sell five hours, five euros, because that would ruin the game. It's then done through boosters, power-ups, these kinds of things, which just let you advance a bit faster. And regarding marketing, um, on the app store, since there's so many apps, marketing has gotten tougher and tougher, definitely, if you don't have a big installed base. 
there are publishers you can work with, like Chilingo and so on. We don't do publishing. We only bring out our own IP. Um, or you can, if you find a niche where you can target people on AdMob, in Mobi, all of these networks, Chartboost, um, then you can market profitably. So there are games who even, despite being free, they're able to pay the one, two, three dollars you have to pay in marketing per download and, uh, and still be successful. And if you can't afford that, then you have to go the grassroots approach, blogs, websites, um, free app a day directories, these kinds of things. Anything else? So you mentioned 70% uh, of uh, the people who play Wugo is female. Um, why, why do you think that is? Is it because of the social aspect? And also I was... Oh. Um, so I was wondering if, if you think uh, the reason why you have such a high female um, audience is because of the social aspect or, or some other aspect. And I was wondering if you compare um, how much people are spending. Are women spending just as much as the guys or are the guys spending more individually? So the question was, um, why, are, why do we have such a high percentage of female players and whether there are differences in spending patterns between males and females, right? So I think the reason we have so many female players are two. First of all, um, our games are not tailored to women, but they're more kind of, I would say, mainstream. So if you look at many other games on Facebook, it's about tanks and dragons and swords. And, and that, of course, is a very male thing, very male kind of in general, with exceptions, type of game. For example, in all VUGA games, it's, you're not able to harm your friends. You can only help them. And that, again, is a very, talking in stereotypes again, male-female thing of kind of harming your friends versus helping them. So that's one thing which is different. And then, of course, I mean, you can see it here, the character design and so on is quite um, mainstream. So I think, on the one hand, our games are m more mainstream than many others. And then females have been completely underserved as a, as a gaming audience in the past. Generally, you would have people at, once in a while, a publisher or a big game developer would bring out a game for women but mostly those would almost be insults. You know, it would be like, dress your doll, you know, these kind of games, which no woman really wants to play. And uh, so I think why we have more women is on the one hand, the games, and on the other hand, that we focus also on this market, uh, which was previously underserved. And regarding spending, the amount men and women spend is about the same. What's really interesting is that women spend more often in smaller amounts, Mean, while men buy uh, less often in larger packages. And um, I don't know, I'm not a psychologist or an anthropologist, I don't know why that's happening, but it's statistically significant um, that men are more, they buy a big package and then hoard it and then slowly use it, while women have more multiple small purchases, more impulse buys. Anything else? Yes. Thank you. I've got two questions about A-B testing. The first one is, how do you uh, decide which features should be A-B tested? And the second one is, uh, do you perform and how do you perform A-B testing on iOS applications? Thank you. So, um, yeah, I think everyone got those, got those questions. So, um, A-B testing, which features do we test? That's the hard part. So you have to approach that by thinking about it. However, as a general rule of thumb, A-B testing should not be used to confirm a product manager's opinion. Because often what you can do is you can have a feature A, product manager thinks of feature B, you run an A-B test, B wins and everyone's happy. What you should do is think about the background of what you're testing and then open up the spectrum. 
think about, let's say, the button example. Think about what could there be on the button. Five things, I don't know, whatever. Five things, characters, question marks, exclamation marks, faces, and grass. And then you do this A-B test and test these five things and find out the winner. So using A-B tests as a simple confirmation is, um, is not a good approach because then you're doing a local optimum and not a global one. The second part about how to do it in both Flash and iOS, um, the game contains both versions. So the same binary, well, it's not a binary on Flash, but the same SWF or binary contains both versions of the game. And then we, um, it's quite simple actually, you, we have the device ID, do a modulo something on that uh, with a prime number and then just get new, new groups every time. And if you do a lot of A-B tests, you also have to really watch out that you don't start conflicting them. So let's say if we had an A-B test where we just turned off the game for 10% of the, of course, they'll all be gone. And then if we do another A-B test after that, with the same 10, 90% split, we'll, have, we'll start getting interdependent effects. So that's where it gets a bit more tricky, but it's doable. I think there was another question. Hi, um, I just had a quick question on the platform. So you said you focus on iOS, um, iPad and iPhone in particular. Um, I just wanted to know, in your opinion, why, and you know, I'm quite interested in the other platforms available, like Android, why don't you focus on things like that? Do you not see an opportunity there, or what are your reasons why it's just focus on iOS? So the question was why we're focusing on iOS versus Android. Um, it's quite simple, really. Android has a much larger reach, much larger installed base. Um, iOS has a few advantages. First of all, everyone has his credit card or bank account put in, meaning um, on Android you have to type in your credit card on the device at least the first time, which is painful. And that leads to less people spending money. The second one is also if you look at Android, iOS, um, just consumer demographics, people who spend six to 800 euros on a phone, on an iPhone, have a different social economic status than the average Android user. But um, Diamond Dash will be coming out on Android in October. And we know that monetization on Android is about factor three lower per player. And now we'll be trying to find out if the number of players is so much bigger that it's worth it. Plus, um, Android is jailbreak and broken more often. I see you smiling there. Uh, I also have two questions. Uh, the first one is with the tools like Unity, 3D, uh, you can deploy to both iOS and Android. Uh, why are you not using them? And the second one is, uh, did you use publishers to push out your games to mobile platforms? And if you did that, what was the experience? Okay, so first question, Unity. Uh, second question is if we use publishers or not. I have to say, first of all, I uh, financed my studies a long time ago when dinosaurs roamed the earth, that was about, uh, by programming, but I don't do engineering anymore. But from what I know, Unity is really good for prototyping. Um, we have some issues with it regarding performance. Where the thing is, if you look at a game like Diamond Dash, it's a pretty simple match three game. The core gameplay was done after about four or five weeks, and then we spent eight months polishing it. And we optimized animation, clicks, frame rate, what happens, old phones, all that stuff, all the polishing. And uh, from what I hear, Unity just adds a layer between you and kind of the, the hardware, uh, which is why we've said we use it for prototyping, but then when we build the, the kind of real version, we redo it. That's what I hear. And the second thing is uh, publishers. No, we haven't used publishers. It's not something I would say to not do if you're a small indie game developer slowly getting out. I mean, companies like Chilingo just have a massive power to bring to your app. Uh, for us, we were already big enough on Facebook and we were confident that we could bring that to mobile. 
simply because on Facebook we have millions of users every day, about 10, 11 million players per day, and that if we just tell them, hey, get Diamond Dash on the mobile, that's enough for to boost us up. Um, but I've heard from many pub from many game developers that they're that publishers are good for like the first game you do maybe the second but then you should start thinking about building your own audience to um to simply escape the standard 30 percent publisher cut they normally take because if you're paying 30 percent to apple then 30 percent to the publisher it starts getting painful yes Uh, I ha also have two questions, if there's time. Um, the first question is, uh, you were just talking about that you usually develop for iOS and then Android, and the reasons why you sp said that it, uh, we have this kind of anecdotal belief, and I, went, I was wondering if you can confirm that or not, that a lot, even though the, the, the Android base is much bigger, that a lot of people who own Android phones don't actually use them, like don't use a lot of apps. They don't play a lot of games. They just kind of use it as a phone and, and read their emails. Um, I was wondering if you might be able to confirm that or deny that or say it's false. And the second question was just, I'm just interested if you might make a few more comments about actually how you do your marketing for your games. Okay, thanks. So, um, regarding the first question, um, I've heard the same anecdotal uh, evi evidence, um, but uh, I can't really put a number on that. But the thing is, what you do have on the Android phones is a much larger variety of devices, screens, etc. So, I would say, for many games, also the playing experience is not as good, simply because it's not, it's always when you have tight hardware specifications, you can really exactly work with it. For our Android development, we have this desk in our office where there's, I think, almost 100 Android devices. And after a while, you're like, yeah, okay, it's good enough on, it's good on 20, and it's good enough on 50, and the other 30, let's not talk about them. And, um, of course, when a consumer on one of those phones gets it, um, he'll not have an awesome experience. So that definitely. Regarding marketing, um, the biggest part for us is product quality. It's um, having good games, bringing them out. Of course, we work closely with Apple. You're talking about mobile especially. or Yes, of course, we work with Apple to get featuring, so kind of show them early what we're doing, um, what's happening, and so on but then having good products with good retention, then you don't need millions of downloads all the time um, to build a, a good user base. So um, to give you an idea, Diamond Dash had, I think, 25 million downloads, of which over 2 million played yesterday. And this is a game which came out in December. So 10% of the population played it yesterday and that really helps what we then do in marketing is just a broad range of of stuff whatever you can imagine from pr over over blogs over paid user acquisition um, we pull a lot from facebook into our games by having having a big fan base there it's pretty much the whole spectrum so i would say two more questions Yeah, actually, I have one, two questions, actually. So as, as far as I know, when it comes to free-to-play games, uh, these days, companies can monetize only the 5% of the user base or less than that. So my first question is, how does Uga identify or find those 5% of users who are most likely to convert to paying users? And the second question is, how do you deal with this conflict between evolving or uh, optimizing your game experience around those 5% versus other, the rest of the percent? Those are very, very good questions. Generally, in, in gaming, what the, the question referred to is in free-to-play games, 95% of the people never spend money and 5% do. And there are gaming companies which focus really closely on those 5%, um, in fact, calling them whales which is a term from the casino industry. You know, whales are the guys who get like the jets to pick them up wherever they live and so on. Um, that's not our approach. Um, it's, there's, I mean, you can, 
whatever. I don't have a big moral standpoint on that. But um, our approach is to make mass market games, which appeal to millions of people who then kind of play and some of them pay. And to not increase your average... So what you can do is you can increase your average revenue per user, meaning I'm earning one cent, two cent, three cents per average user, or I can earn, av uh, optimize my RPPU, average revenue per paying user. So either I have more people playing, more people paying, or the ones who do pay spend more. And that's just two different approaches. The ones who do the, I have few people, but they spend more, are more mid-core games, Kabam, Kingdoms of Camelot, um, Custom Street Racing, uh, all the bingo, slot machine games, those kinds of things. While we don't, we don't focus on the 5%, of course, they're important for us. But um, for us, even a really heavy Diamond Dash player, I think it's hard to spend more than 100 euros a month on Diamond Dash. While if you have a slot machine games, you have people spending thousands of dollars per month. So we look at the 5%, but we don't optimize the game for them. So I think um, that's pretty much it time-wise. I'll be here for a few more minutes if you have uh, any questions. If not, if you see the turquoise t-shirts over there with the VUGA logos on the chest, you know what they're about. Um, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much, Jan, for sharing your learnings. Um, so, guys, if you're looking for a job, check out Vuga. I've seen their office, it's awesome. So, <laughs> thanks again. <laughs> okay, and we will be back at half past four with Rovem Nerd from Brazil. So, come back.